Thank you for joining us for this momentous event. My name is Tariq Khalil and I'm honored to moderate the launch of the Palestinian Assembly for Liberation, PAL, P-A-L. The basic foundational principle of PAL is unity. And since the Palestinian people are demographically fragmented, geographically separated, deprived of our basic civil and human rights enshrined under international law, PAL has come to the fore to declare that the reunification of the Palestinian national body is a prerequisite to our people's ability to mass organize and develop escalated local and global interventions to survive and defeat Zionist and Israeli colonization and subjugation of our land and our people. And so the mission statement is very basic and simple. The Palestinian Assembly for Liberation is committed to strengthening Palestinian mobilizations for liberation and return, to advancing the political power and representation of Palestinians in spaces and institutions that impact our rights, and to forging a renewed Palestinian unity by strengthening our socioeconomic and political bonds. So our mission is not limited in demographic and geographic scope. The focus is not only about Palestinians living under military occupation in the West Bank, or the Palestinians living under a brutal blockade and siege in Gaza, or the Palestinians living under an apartheid state apparatus in 1948 Palestine, but instead encompasses the entire Palestinian community from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea and the Palestinian diaspora. This is a mission aimed at the entire Palestinian collective, all 13.5 million of us. So PAL embraces the we are all in this together paradigm. This sentiment can be summed up with the words of one of the people in the world in 2021, Muhammad al-Kurd from Sheikh Jarrah in Jerusalem. He said, quote, summarizing the struggle of an entire nation by one or few faces as symbols is not enough to advocate Palestinian people. What we are asking for is a radical and tangible change to the media system worldwide to end their bias towards Zionism and push them to be bolder, talking about the liberation movements and the Palestinian resistance in all its forms. The new era that the Palestinians are witnessing is the result of the struggle. This is why PAL envisions a liberated Palestine as a seat of morality and indigenous dignity, equity, and justice for all Palestinians. We are committed to the noble and unyielding pursuit of justice and self-determination. PAL's mission and vision is broad, yet targeted, specific, yet all-encompassing. There's much more to flesh out about PAL, its mission, its vision, and its founding principles. But before we move on with the program, I want to just take a few moments to commemorate the 39th anniversary of the Sabra and Shatila massacre, which occurred between September 16th, September 18th, 1982. Approximately 3,500 people perished. Many of the victims were buried in mass graves whose bodies have not been brought up, and some perished under the ruins of their homes, and an unknown amount were taken never to be seen again. While many of the victims' names are unknown, Sabra and Shatila will forever live in the collective memory of the Palestinian people. And now we move on to our program. I have two powerhouse speakers from PAL who will take us through PAL's journey and expound on its mission and vision. After that, I will introduce our special guest, Abay Aboudi and other members of PAL. Let me introduce uh, both of you, Lamis and Amani, and then the floor is yours. Thank you. 
What a powerful video and uh, what a powerful uh, organization this is. And um, I want to introduce um, you and Lemise right now. And um, I want you to take us through this journey and how PAL got to where it is right now and expound on its mission and vision. Uh, I'll introduce both of you and then uh, the floor is yours. Lemise will go first and then you, Amen. Lemis Deek is an internationally practicing attorney based in New York who engages in litigation, compliance, and policy work related to human rights, corruption, and commercial activity. She has litigated and crafted policies to protect against anti-Muslim and anti-Arab and anti-Palestinian state and institutional practices in the U.S. and abroad, including recently securing several victories against anti-Palestinian IRA, which stands for International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IRA measures in several jurisdictions. She's been a community organizer and activist for over 21 years and is the co-convener of the Palestinian Assembly for Liberation. Amekat is a community organizer and a former fashion designer. She is dedicated to advancing the unequivocal rights of all people with a particular focus on refugees, the right to self-determination and equality for the Palestinian people. She's currently the national chairperson for al Auda Palestine Right to Return Coalition and the vice president of the Palestine Foundation. Emani is also a grassroots and campaign organizer in coordination with several coalitions in Los Angeles. Emis Deek, we'll start with you and then we'll go with Emani. The floor is yours. Thank you so much to Tarek um, and Rami uh, and Haytham and everybody who's been dealing with the glitches and Emani as well, who's co-hosting and managing this, um, aside from doing all of the work. First and foremost, and above all, we salute all Palestinian freedom fighters um, Palestinian freedom fighters are global heroes. We salute our people, our Palestinian people in Israeli dungeons, in American dungeons, wherever they are. We salute and honor the Palestinian refugees and the survivors of the numerous massacres. And we also, a special salute and a, a word of gratitude to all of the people who've been a part of the Palestinian Assembly for Liberation in, in its various names. We democratically decided on the name of Palestinian Assembly for Liberation. Um, this is a really, you know, this is still, uh, I would still call this a relatively soft launch. Um, and so this should be more of a reconvening um, and an introductory phase for a lot of the folks who joined over the past week um, and all of those who are hopefully joining us today. I'm going to be quite casual uh, and I'm going to do my best to be very short because we'd like to hear from a lot of you, but equally importantly, we'd like you to hear um, and engage with uh, many of the brilliant, tireless members of PAL 
who are in the room and will share um, and have, I'm sure, very rich exchanges with each other and with the rest of you. I think one of the best ways to summarize what we've been trying to do now um, to launch is what is the best way to realize Palestinian power um, and enforce, not just merely preserve Palestinian rights, but to enforce Palestinian um, rights. And how do we do that? And we considered having looked at um, <laughs> and studied a lot of other struggles and moments in our history uh, inside Palestine and outside Palestine. I think what can be summarized in a few ways. First, we realized we needed to develop a meaningfully inclusive uh, or begin developing a meaningfully inclusive mechanism that doesn't just include the people who are present and represented, but can work to be thoughtful and inclusive of others. That this vehicle would be the beginning of our reunion until our return, inshallah, which can coordinate and connect and rebuild between Palestinians with a thoughtful, calculated, and elaborately articulated value basis and guiding principles that would serve to reignite and sustain a critical Palestinian mass that's organized and therefore can situate that coordinated organized Palestinian mass and its voices at the forefront of the Palestinian liberation struggle and in all spaces where Palestinian rights are addressed, including in the solidarity movement, while at the same time endeavoring a step further to consider how do we also situate Palestine as a seat of global morality? How do we reflect a society that, that preempts all of the malcontents from which we have suffered? And with the understanding that especially as Palestinians in North America, in the U.S., and outside, we have particular resources, right? We have particular privileges, and therefore we have the capacity to play a critical role. And they could be as simple as simply having the right to speech or free movement, but certainly we realize that we have the capacity to give the time and intellectual effort and creativity that can make us thoughtful as we're helping rebuild and build a stronger movement for Palestinian liberation, which required that we avoid being rhetoric, that we're not rhetorically dynamic, and that we are absolutely not being reactionary. And this required us to be quite critical and very honest and to strike a number of difficult balances that we're still working to strike. Um, I, just to kind of situate what, uh, what led us to this conclusion, if uh, Rami, could you just mute everybody, um, and that way it's only one mic. Thanks. Um, and so, you know, uh, PAL, PAL began, uh, was initiated in 2018, and it was inspired by various mobilizations across the world to reignite and reactivate Palestinians outside of Palestine. We've avoided using the word diaspora, and we can discuss that later. Um, and so we were, many of us who are represented here were contacted and said, hey, come look at this, come consider this. And the first thought that I had was, well, we've tried this before a few times. Uh, one of the first times that I was involved in this experiment, and I think experiments are perfectly fine, it's better than not trying at all, but the first time we were involved in a similar experiment was in 2006 when a call went from our elders, from you know the vanguard of, guard of the Palestinian liberation struggle who are no longer with us coming upon the anniversary looking to 2008, and there we had the launch of these various diaspora initiatives. And I had an inside view as to how and why they were falling apart. And then all of us who also did began these conversations of can we critically look at our efforts, which requires critically looking at ourselves as a movement, as, um, as a resistance, uh, as communities, wherever we are, communities in the US, individually, um, as solidarity organizations. And there are a couple of things that are particularly important in condition. Um, please mute. Thank you. So there are a couple of things that are particular to the Palestinian condition. We are presently the only active, we're not the only colonial project, we are the only active settler colonial project for the purpose of genocide. 
which means that we are in a holding pattern, pattern of constant crisis, real severe crisis, right? We are also one of the few societies that has been strewn to the four corners of the earth and that on the ground itself suffer from some of what are quite frankly precedent setting novel mechanisms, physical, political, economic mechanisms of separation. And this has created this fragmentation, this difference even between culture, this difficulty in conversation, in understanding, in communicating, in coordinating physically just for resistance. Now, of course, Palestinians clearly, um, epically, time and again, are able to overcome these barriers, but we really needed to think and deconstruct all the various layers of this. And this required, above all, that we undertake a very studied, calculated process. And there were things to study, right? There were the African and Global South anti-colonial struggles and movements, and what, you know, what are called the practical philosophers, the people who are reading and implementing, right? Those were the guide and the guiders, right? The guidance for a lot of what we were trying to understand about ourselves, understand what happened to us, understand how we have formed in reaction to this. So we began with a lot of research and studying. And this required first and foremost, I believe above all else, is being able to articulate what we came to eventually call inspired by Amilcar Cabral, our various tribalisms, but also our various conditions as a result of our oppression. Um, and so the first step was to be able to articulate what are the ailments, internal and external, to give them big elaborate words so that when we can define the problem, when we can define this sense that we're having, this dynamic that we're experiencing, we can then define the solution because undefined problems are uh, 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 undefined problems are unsolved problems. You know, so we could say that we want a Palestine that is liberated and just and fair. We want return. We want to be united. How do we do that requires we understand what that means and what obstacles we faced and have stopped us from being able to more effectively um, do this as a strong critical mass that has the, the force of enforcement. So what we did is have these long big study sessions, long big conversations. We would work and draft and come back and then we would take this back to the bigger collective for edits and input and we continued this process over the course of of uh, three years now, at some point, with a special shout out to the people on the Unity Committee, at some point, I think, you know, one of our drafts on the, the, the Unity uh, Committee was probably over 60 pages. So we avoided being rhetoric or dogmatic. We counted every idea and every word and, and every sensibility. And from this, we began developing uh, two things. Number one, what came to be the maximal, my tablet's overheating, so I'm gonna switch to the other one, excuse me. Um, I lost my point briefly, but I think that we were talking about, you know, developing, thinking of critical ways to develop what is this value basis, right? We needed to figure out um, first what are all of the issues and then what is the value basis, right? Articulated in clear language, um, in clear understanding of our obstacles, internal and external, um, so that we have a clear, very long, well-articulated value basis and therefore guiding principles that can survive and sustain all of the in you know the obstacles internal and external that that we could that we would face right that have not allowed prior quote unquote diaspora prior reunification initiatives prior coordination initi initiatives to survive conflict right and coming to an agreement about what commitment looks like despite whatever other issues we face, can we secure? And almost, almost like a metric, right? So for example, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about structure and then I'll move on, but can we establish a metric of values and priorities um, 
on the micro level, on the macro level, as relates to sustainability of return, as to not reproducing systems of injustice, that balances between the individual and the collective while prioritizing the collective good. You know, so that when, for example, we're faced, because if we want to have a representational body, and we'll discuss this along with structure, and Amani will raise this with registration, you know, that we're going to have caucuses, and we're going to have blocks, and we're going to have party uh, aspirations, and we're going to have different ideological competitions. So therefore, what can we build and articulate from now that will allow us to have a metric so that when these natural dynamics arise, we can evaluate them. How damaging are they? Have they complied with our utmost goals, with our vision of justice, with our vision of liberation? Have they compromised any of that? Are they hurting the collective? And so that was why we developed this really broad, long, which is not yet published, and we're still actually working on it and hope to work on it with the Palestinians here, these you know, points of maximal unity, right? Micro and macro, right? Um, eh, and along these same lines, we were also imagining what a structure could look like. The difference with between the unity efforts and these articulations of our value bases in, in as much detail as possible, and the structure is that there are only so many versions of a structure that one can have that could be represented. And so that structure would also have to be influenced and informed by the value bases that we were discussing. And I, you know, I think it, it, it was, it seemed prescient then that when we had our first soft launch of the Palestinian Assembly for Liberation, our first PAL launch, was on the anniversary of the Palestinian general strike of 1936, right? And it, it also appeared almost prescient that when we issued our statement for our demand for our escalating the demands of the Palestinian liberation and the Palestinian solidarity movement to what it was during the May battle of uh, Saif al-Quds, they were seamlessly adopted almost verbatim across the U.S. for sure, and I'm sure globally, as regards now what is our demands and how do we articulate and relate that demand to our actions now. It, it was within days, if not weeks, and now currently, that many organizations, even some of the leading Palestinian organizations, are adopting. Same thing with, uh, and we'll hear from Ubay about this as well, it seemed prescient that we were all on the same page and making advanced demands while actually giving steps, right? Speaking in details and not in dogmatic grandstanding rhetoric, right? Understanding the reality on the ground and making these proposals, which were also adopted. And it's not prescient. It's not a coincidence. It's because everything that we're doing is happening in a calculated study, studied way with the welfare and an understanding of the real conditions our people live under in Palestine and globally. And by doing our best to constantly, all the members constantly being connected, some we constantly connected on a daily basis from Gazi. Uh, so we didn't have that disconnection. We were never rhetorical or reflexive or reactionary, and we continue to build. We have a long way to go. I don't know how long I've been with um, the delays, so maybe I can I can kind of skip. Tarek, feel free, uh, Rami, if you could un unmute Tarek, who's keeping time. Um, you know, I'll, I do want to touch a little bit about the process that we undertook in May 2018. Uh, as we built up to the first physical convening, when we could convene physically, what we did is reach out to pretty much everybody because the idea was to build a tent that could withstand the winds of change, but that could also withstand all the bumps and bruises when you have a collective that can keep all of us together as we build out and build out the structure. So we reached out to everybody in a very targeted way um, and, and developed the first set of documents, tried to incorporate the input, and then hosted the meeting, the first meeting in Chicago in May 2018. So we went in with these documents merely as a guidance, as guiding principles, which people then spent many hours, you know, and it was lovely. I smiled because it was a great and important exercise, debating and crafting and editing and having very heated discussions, important, difficult discussions that we were not having directly with each other for a long time, that we were pussyfooting around for 
decades. Um, and so we were having these difficult conversations and, and this led then to developing various committees um, and elected a temporary preparatory committee, which was uh, tasked with making sure things keep going. Now we can keep developing some of the basis of the, you know, the, the sticks for the tent, uh, if you will. And so we would go back, the preparatory committee would help devise, you know, and discuss, and then we would go back and draft. We would do homework, we'd have meetings, we would go back and draft matters related to structure, matter, matters related to unity, to our issues, to what we envision. And then we would convene again with the larger body and subject all of this to editing. In February, I believe it was, correct me, uh, Amani, afterwards, in February when we had the kind of final decision to have come into bringing about at least one phase of the structure that we had preliminarily agreed to or saw no objection for, then we had brought in a larger body beyond the preparatory committees that were being elected by the General Assembly or, or whatever it was called at the time. Um, and so we kept this democratic inclusive process, which was difficult, right? First, there's a lot of crafting and thinking and debate and discussion with people that you're, you don't know because this is all over the U.S. Second, this is happening, you know, virtually. Third, these are very heavy matters. Fourth, after you did this, you know, large, smaller, then there was th these really intense crafting, discussion, challenging sessions that we had to do. And so it was as democratic as possible um, and tried to balance the need for democratic building and participatory, I should say, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of some of those, those terminologies, especially in the West, but of a participatory process in deciding who and what we are and what we look like, at least ala rus aklamha, right? while also meeting the need of having to proceed forward, having to expand the number of voices who are part of devising this, right? Who can then build this representational base that can be physically represented in what happens on the ground and everywhere in the world, that we can be finally included and visible and one functioning body. And it was, it, it, it was and it is a very difficult and challenging endeavor, but I believe it can be one of the most fruitful. And I think one of the greatest takeaways, I'll stop on this, Point, I feel like I've been going for a while. Um, I think one of the things that I hope that everybody realizes is that, yes, our conditions are rather unique, but uh, we are an incredibly, incredibly skilled and powerful people. Our conditions have forced us to, to do that. And one of the things that I think all of us enjoyed the most was constantly realizing, no matter our differences, how smart, how brave, how committed, right? How self-deprecating we're willing to be, how much we're willing to sacrifice and come back to the table and say, yeah, I mean, okay, next, this is what I can offer. Um, on that note, you know, uh, actually I just, you know, uh, worlds, states, countries, centuries were built by a handful of people that I don't think had the tenacity and the passion that so many of the people on this call at this moment too. And all of the people from 2018 until now have shown time and again through thick and thin and even when people aren't able to participate fully. And so I think what has kept us going is that all of us believe in each other and all of us believe that every moment of strength in our history and in the world's history is marked by mass, organized, united work that enriches, supports, respects, showcases all of our powers and our strengths. Thank you, Tariq, and I turn it over to you, Amani. Thank you, Lamis. Um, marhaba, everyone. How are you? Thank you all for being with us today and for being so patient. Um, no matter how much we prepare, we tend to uh, have these kind of glitches. Um, like Lemmy said, um, it's been a process and uh, it's been a beautiful process in so many ways. So many thoughts went into a lot of the uh, points that you heard about and a lot more that you did not hear about um, and that we would love for you to get involved so you can learn um, a bit more. What I'm going to be talking about is uh, uh, a project that we are so excited to launch uh, because we feel it is um, something that will help all of us activists, all of us Palestinian organizations to advance our work better. 
we are not here to replace anybody's work. We're not here to add one more organization onto um, the arena of Palestinian organizations. Um, that was very much uh, in our minds as we were developing and working on the focus and the mission and vision of the statement. So one of the uh, projects that we um, uh, are happy to start and launch, it's called Sejil Ana Palestini. Sejil Ana Palestini is an, an initiative that the Palestine Assembly for Liberation is excited to launch in cooperation with Palestinian American communities and organization. The initiative aims to register all Palestinians in North America in a comprehensive database. The, pur the purpose is to collect statistical data, facilitate grassroots initiatives, and strengthen the network of Palestinian communities in the U.S. We recognize the challenges that resulted in the inaccurate numbers of the Palestinian community in North America, and we believe now more than ever is crucial to reach precise number of Palestinian communities to, organ to organize better and utilize our collective power to advance our just cause in general and to help facilitate uh, PAL's mission in particular. Sejil Ana Palestini is the labor and the aftermath of continuous uh, brainstorming discussions that my colleagues and I had for the last three years, and the study of previously attempted similar initiative that some of us were involved in but did not materialize. You see, as Lamise pointed out, it's been a process. But no doubt, mapping our Palestinian community and identifying the resources of various Palestinian groups, organizations, and individuals was our goal right from the get-go. So we were genuinely excited to launch this project, and we hope you too will agree this initiative is worthy of your support. Now, I'm gonna share with you uh, some of the goals that we aspire to achieve uh, with this initiative. We like to collect demographic data's, uh, data on Palestinians in North America. We're gonna be starting off first with um, the US and we hope if we succeed in building a good model that this model can be duplicated to be used in North America and then elsewhere inshallah, uh, determine the portion of percentage um, of refugees and whether or not they're registered with UNRWA. That's another goal. And uh, to create a database of Palestinians using the population data, we would love to build an, an interactive map um, uh, to help with mobilizing Palestinians in North America for Palestine liberation, right of return initiative, as well as uh, voter mobilization, including organi organizing toward uh, North America representation, absentee voting, and so forth. We want to analyze uh, metadata and uh, the web-based system of Palestinian communities, facilitate the reunification of ethnically cleansed family members through a unique feature that we will include on the app that we would like to establish, um, reviving the memory of destroyed villages, supporting and sharing existing Palestinian rec uh, record initiatives such as the Palestine Remembered and al -Auda. promote Palestinian professionals uh, and businesses, issue, we would love to issue a symbolic digital al -Auda passport for all um, our community here in, in North America. Um, we thought about, um, like we asked the question, who qualifies to register for this uh, initiative? Anyone whose father or mother is Palestinian uh, can qualify to register for um, this initiative. Uh, we understand there's going to be challenges and our work will determine how to incentivize people to sign because that's going to be a challenge, how to keep them engaged through the process, uh, and we call that community building. Uh, how do we get good data that is not infiltrated? This is a big challenge that we're discussing and looking into in parentheses uh, security. So um, 
what are the methods that we're hoping to do this with? Of course, um, through web and mobile app development, uh, social media, ads, all kind of ads, TV, radio, billboards. I mean, hopefully, inshallah, we'll have uh, the budget to manage to uh, have a good campaign that supports this. Um, and also building partnerships with Palestinian organizations. Now, in order to do this, this is all an idea that we're very excited to work on, but we need to put together like a task force team with certain expertise. And um, my uh, hope is that uh, if you get excited enough about the project today that you will contact us uh, and, and tell us you wanna be part of this team that's going to be working on developing this program. And uh, we're looking for people in legal background, IT software engineers, uh, developers, cybersecurity, business development, marketing, uh, accounting, graphic design, statistics. You know, uh, the core team will develop a process that understands online user experience and behavior, challenges, assumptions, and re uh, redefine uh, problems and create innovative prototypes and test through a design thinking pro uh, approach. So we're hoping once we put together uh, like the right team that through this uh, design thinking approach, we will come up with a solid plan and a campaign um, uh, that would help us uh, achieve this particular goal of registering our Palestinian community. Now, the tentative budget needed to start this particular um, initiative based on, um, and I'm saying tentative because uh, talking to different software developers and stuff, and this is a modest number, this is with people giving us help and stuff, where uh, as a number to start off with, probably uh, I was told about between 15 to 20,000. And for sure, we can better determine the amount once we have a team and we come up with a more solid plan that would encompass all the points that I mentioned to you. So with that said, I'll close. This is um, uh, what I was tasked to uh, inform you and to tell you about the, the project that we're launching with. I sure hope all of you will um, join us in uh, registering if you're Palestinian and help us uh, make this uh, goal come through. Thank you, Tarek. And everyone, of course. Thank you so much, Amani. Thank you, Lemis. Um, thank you both for giving us uh, more context on PAL's vision, mission, and goals and uh, projects and what we, what we intend to do moving forward. And it is my great honor to introduce our special guest, Obay Aboudi, who in 1998, at the age of 14, was awarded a medal and shield by the League of Arab Countries to honor him and his academic achievements and excellence for an essay he wrote on the occasion of Arab Children's Day. He got his master's in economics from Berzeit University in the West Bank. His thesis was titled, a new approach for estimating the effect of minimum wage on employment, Palestine as an example. He plans to pursue his doctoral studies in the same subject. He, sp he spent about 1.5 years as the program coordinator and supervisor at the YWCA Center for Youth Education, then worked for four years at the MNE officer at the Union of Agricultural Committees. There he worked with small farmers and helped them adopt more sustainable practices his current position as the executive director of the Ramallah-based Bisan Center for Research and Development is another example of that dedication to, ed to education and helping the disadvantaged Palestinian society, particularly the youth and women. The most recent initiative that Obay has been deeply focusing on at Bisan involved coordinating and hosting meetings among the most prominent Palestinian scientists to help prepare the third international meeting for science in Palestine. This was planned to be held at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts in January of 2020. He was working to make this happen up until he was forcefully taken by the Israeli military from his home at 3 a.m. on Wednesday, November 13, uh, 13 2019. Because of Obey's protests against the PA and demanding accountability 
for the murder of Nizar Benet and Palestinian security services repression and abuse of Palestinian activists and for calling for democratization of Palestinian institutions, including the Palestinian National Council, PNC, and the Palestinian Legislative Council, PLC. He now faces two criminal charges brought by the PA, one for free assembly and the other for critiquing the PA. We're honored to have this courageous voice with us today. Obey, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tarek. Uh... And thank you for the people from uh, PAL Assembly, especially Lamis and Damani for their wonderful presentations. Uh, I want to stress one point that a lot of the things that uh, Palestinians are talking about in the diaspora, we are also talking about it here in Palestine. And it's sometimes just amazing how initiatives are uh, moving together. Uh, Although we might not know about each other, this is the, uh, because of the ethnic cleansing of the occupation, of course. But uh, uh, we are still have, I think, uh, a solid base as a people, as activists uh, uh, that want to bring on uh, free Palestine. Um, I would like to start a little bit with updates, what's happening now on the ground in the West Bank and especially with Palestinian uh, prisoners and with the uh, case of uh, the martyr Nizar Banat. And uh, then I want to talk about uh, mass unity and uh, the objectives of the movement in the streets and the connections, of course, with uh, uh, the diaspora. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm sure that everyone is aware that uh, Nizar has been assassinated over uh, two months ago uh, by a force from the PA security that came to arrest him on, the ca on a case at 3 a.m. on a case that falls under freedom of speech for critiquing the Palestinian uh, President Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, the security force uh, beat him up. Uh, severely uh, and they beat him literally to death. The Palestinian Authority tried to cover that up. The governor of Hebron uh, uh, issued a statement at around 8 a.m. Uh, on Thursday morning of uh, his assassination saying that Nizar died of uh, a heart attack. And then as details came out, uh, people were uh, sure that uh, uh, he was assassinated as a result of uh, the PA assault on him. Uh, there were mass protests right from the beginning. Uh, the first protest was in Ramallah held at uh, 1 p.m. And uh, organically, the people shouted for Mahmoud Abbas to leave. Just leave. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas, of course, for us, uh, he is uh, the first uh, person, and this is the statements of the movement from the street, the first person that's responsible for the assassination of Nizar Banat, and uh, as he is now responsible for a lot of the things that are happening that are derailing the Palestinian struggle towards freedom and liberation. The protests were met from the beginning with a heavy hand from the PA. The PA assaulted uh, everyone on the streets. They didn't uh, mind or take uh, notice to the age of the people or uh, 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 gender or anything. So people were uh, assaulted and the assaults were especially aggressive against uh, Palestinian women activists, women activists in the streets who I want to say with complete uh, objectiveness is that uh, women have young women, young women activists were the leaders in the initial days, week uh, of the uh, movement of the streets, protest movement in the streets. Uh, the PA has weaponized their bodies, the bodies of the activists against them, and they stole their phones, published uh, private photographs on social media. They sexually assaulted them, uh, they uh, threatened their families, 
and they began a wide system of uh, repression that I'm sure uh, a lot of you have heard on it. The direct effect of this kind of repression on women, uh, especially young women activists, is that in the later weeks, young women withdrew from the streets because they were uh, so much afraid of the weaponizing of uh, their bodies against them. There were literally uh, mass sexual assault carried out by uh, individuals that are belonging to the Palestinian Authority security apparatus against women activists in the street. Uh, there were arrests over, uh, if I want to give an exact number, I think there were over 80 uh, arrests for uh, activists since the assassination of Nizar Banat until today. Those are by the PA I'm talking alone. I'm not talking right now about Israeli arrests. But there were also Israeli harassments for activists, uh, incursions into civil society organizations uh, such as Bissan. And uh, uh, so it was a dual state of uh, repression. One from the Israelis, the second one from our own blood from the Palestinian Authority. Uh, the movement in the streets, it actually there was a lot of mobilization. The mobilization uh, came from a lot of um, people that uh, I want to say that we didn't even used to talk to each other on a regular basis, daily basis. And uh, the struggle in the streets has, uh, plus the arrests, plus facing the repression, has I think formulated a strong core for the uh, movement for the mass movement that's uh, beginning to formalize in uh, the West Bank against the PA and uh, this strong core is actually uh, has actually agreed on three main demands as the demands of uh, the movement those three main demands the first one is we are demanding for uh, general elections, the Palestinian National Council, Palestinian Legislative Council, and even Palestinian Presidency. Uh, this comes from the belief that uh, uh, the Palestinian people know their direction, and the Palestinian people, if given democratic control of their future, they will choose wisely and they will choose uh, uh, honestly, they will choose the people that uh, best represent them and people that uh, best can uh, best defend the Palestinian existence against the continued ethnic cleansing uh, uh, that the Israeli occupation has carrying out against us as a people. Uh, of course, uh, when we are demanding uh, national uh, election on all levels, uh, we are really aware that the Palestinian Authority has been formulated according to Oslo, but we are also uh, really aware that we want to change the role of this authority from the political role, which is which it has taken over from the Palestinian Liberation Organization, and give back the political role to the Palestinian Liberation Organization and have the Palestinian Authority transformed into a kind of large municipality that can uh, manage the daily lives of the people, uh, focus on education, focus on healthcare, uh, which of, of course uh, all of these issues the Palestinian Authority has failed in since its inception. Uh, the second uh, demand that we are that has formulated in the streets is uh, justice for Nizar Banat. And when we are talking about justice for Nizar Banat, we are talking about having uh, an independent commission carrying out uh, an uh, investigation on the entire political and security levels that were involved in his assassination. Uh, as you might. <coughs> As you might hear, the Palestinian Authority started after a lot of international and internal pressure, started to present uh, uh, the 14 uh, uh, members of the preventive security that have participated in the arrest and assassination of Nizar Banat to a military court. Of course, uh, we have little confidence in the military, in the Palestinian military court. 
uh, as we also have uh, little confidence in the entire Palestinian uh, court system. Uh, we know and we are, have well documented that it has been co-opted by the uh, Palestinian executive branch, which is co-opted by the president's office and the president himself. So it's actually one big puppet show. Uh, so what we are demanding is for an independent commission that will do the investigation and will determine what political and high level security uh, were involved in the assassination. Was there a decision to kill Nizar or wasn't there? All of those issues are not clear until now. And the case of Nizar is really exemplary of uh, the actions of the PA because for the first week that uh, after his assassination, no one was even arrested from the security force that arrested him in full health at 3 a.m. And at 4.30 uh, a.m. he was announced dead in Hebron Hospital. So in one and a half hours, those people that have beaten him up to death, where no one of them was uh, arrested until actually there was much public, uh, uh, I would say, mobilization, uh, discontent, uh, uh, going out on marching against the PA. Uh, uh, until this uh, public uh, pressure happened, after that they arrested those 14 members, but they are trying to keep the thing, the investigation with the 14 members. Uh, the last demand that we are having right now is, uh, prevent, is uh, the issue of freedom, uh, complete freedom of course. And when we are talking about freedom, we are demanding that the PA respect its uh, basic law, respect the Palestinian law, the Palestinian Declaration of Independence, that talk about freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. We want also the rule of law, the uh, leaders of the security apparatus, whether it was preventive security or intelligence or Palestinian police, are all uh, in their positions against the law. They have, uh, and we are very vocal about that, they have established a kind of uh, kingdom inside each security apparatus that uh, best serves the interests of a small group of a small group of at the head of, uh, uh, head of, of uh, uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, it will uh, mic and dick so this, uh, we are also talking about uh, uh, the, uh, also the accountability for the attacks that happened against activists, the accountability also of the attacks that happened especially against women activists, because up until this moment, even uh, when these attacks have been well documented in the Palestinian media, uh, no, no one, not a single soldier, not a single one member of uh, the security forces has been held accountable for his attacks, his or her attacks, of course, against Palestinian protesters. Um, of course, uh, this is what's happening right now on the ground. I want to add to that that uh, uh, since the beginning of this month, the escape of the six people from the six uh, freedom fighters, the six beacons of hope from uh, uh, the Israeli Zionist prison of Galbua. This actually gave a lot of hope, a euphoria, a feeling of euphoria for the people. And this has manifested itself with the interaction with the news of the prisoners, the mass protests that are happening right now, actually even all over the West Bank. Uh, and these mass protests have even, a lot of them have ended up in the, with clashes with the Israeli occupation forces on different checkpoints. So this feeling of euphoria for having people, Palestinian prisoners, uh, putting forward their issue once again and challenging the occupation and being able to beat this entire security system that they have and escaping from the prisons has given a lot of uh, momentum even on the ground. Uh, the biggest momentum there is, of course, is from Janine governorate, especially in Janine uh, refugee camp, 
the Israeli forces are now uh, op talking publicly of doing another operation similar to the one that was done in 2002 against Jenin uh, uh, camp. And we need to understand that uh, although the images that people might receive, they might see them very hopeful, etc. But it's also important to understand that we are basically talking about an unarmed population that is facing ethnic cleansing from uh, uh, nuclear power, which is the state, uh, the de facto state of Israel. And uh, this actually uh, puts, I think, a lot of pressure on all Palestinians, especially activists uh, and solidarity with Palestine, also from abroad, to uh, put a focus on Israeli violations right now against prisoners, put a focus on Jenin refugee camps so that not another massacre like the one committed in 2002 will be done once again uh, in 2021. Um, for us in the streets, uh, we met a lot of, uh, we met each other, uh, the activists I would say, and we started talking while we were organizing, while we were even, I think that one of the most beneficial uh, periods for organizing and discussion discussion was the days that we were arrested with the PA. We were put uh, in similar cells, right, right on the same cells, some of us right next to each other. So we had a lot of hours. Of course, we were on hunger strike, but we were able to talk even more, get to know each other even more, see each other struggle against the repression of the jailers even if they were Palestinian jailers, uh, and this is unfortunate, but uh, even more. So we got to know each other. We got to know who's serious, who's coming just for a little bit for the ride, and who's going for the entire journey. And we were also talking, we were able to talk about uh, the directions, the perceptions, uh, the ideas of how things can progress forward, what's the way out for us as a people. And our answers are actually when I talked with Lamis, <laughs> we found that, that they were similar answers of Palestinian activists uh, in the US and Europe that were talking together because I think that the heart is in the same place and uh, we have gained a lot of experience, all of us uh, facing this kind of repression, whether it was in Palestine or. So Assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, just wrap up with the last minute here so we can uh, okay. have uh, some, some, yeah, if you can just conclude it okay. with uh, your concluding remarks. Thank okay. you. So uh, the main thing that we are focusing on is that the need for a mass democratic mobilization for Palestinian community. This mass uh, democratic mobilization needs to emancipate the people from all the powers, whether they were political, whether they were uh, traditional leadership that uh, have taken the mandate away from the people. Uh, when we are talking about mass mobilization, we are also talking about a uh, movement that centers on Palestinian rights, the right of return, the right for self-determination, the right for dignity and freedom, all of these basic rights, unalienable rights, all of those rights are connected to all of us. When we are talking about this kind of connection, we started, actually we have set up, we have just set up a website, uh, but we didn't launch it yet uh, because of uh, the situation for the same idea that uh, Amani was talking about, the registration of Palestinians uh, globally in order to be able to do this kind of uh, getting to know each other. Of course, uh, we don't think that uh, PA official numbers of Palestinians, globally 13 million, are correct. Uh, we challenge them. We say that our population worldwide is between 20 and 25 million, and we are willing to uh, fight for that number, and we want to have our entire population registered uh, in secure servers for Palestinians in order to have this kind of democratic, uh, deciding democratically who our leadership is, and what are the program that we are all behind. One last thing uh, for the connections with the uh, diaspora and with, Palestinians, with Palestinians everywhere. We believe that uh, one thing that uh, uh, Saif al-Quds has achieved is that getting back to the basics. Our uh, struggle is a national liberation struggle. Palestine 
is the entirety of Palestine, uh, 27,000 kilometers uh, plus extra. Uh, and uh, we have Palestinians everywhere are connected to it and have a right to return and have a right to self-determination and we can achieve that. This is the extra thing that uh, uh, was understood by everyone. So sorry for taking too long and uh, I'm willing to elaborate more on the questions. Thank you, Abai, uh, uh, for this incredible, uh, uh, for these incredible words. And thank you for being with us. Uh, I want to introduce myself. My name is Rami Aqal, uh, originally from Ramallah. I'm an activist and I'm an attorney. Um, I have been involved in uh, AL uh, since uh, its creation and back in 2018. Uh, I was lucky enough and privileged to attend um, the uh, 2018, uh, May 18 uh, Chicago meeting. Um, and I just remember the energy and how amazing everyone was. Um, this is coming uh, from a perspective of uh, a first generation refugee who um, we lived in Jordan. We have Jordanian passports, my entire family, and even my cousins and extended family. Um, what I have been feeling is that the energy uh, around Palestine has been kind of uh, winding down uh, with time. A lot of our, my Palestinian cousins and family, sometimes you see that they're not talking about, about Palestine much. Um, you see other um, community members who are affiliating themselves with, you know, the state that where they are residing or um, kind of just um, isolated from the P Palestinian issue. Um, and to me, that's kind of what the Zionists want. And I know that's what they want. They want to scatter us. They want us to be scattered and they want us to be uh, in every country around the world and just kind of leave Palestine behind us. And we will not do that. This is the energy that Pal will bring in. We want all the Palestinians to come together in this concerted effort to reorganize and strengthen our communities. We want to not only liberate Palestine, but what we want to we want to rebuild Palestine. Um, so I'm very privileged to be part of this and uh, every other uh, leader here that we have. Uh, I'm not going to mention names, but you know who you are. Um, even at a younger age, I've seen the same people that I'm working with now uh, have this very strong, consistent message about Palestine. And I, I, I really trust them and I, I, and, I, and I want them to continue doing what they're doing. Um, PAL for me is um, a way for us to come together, Palestinians for Palestine, uh, regardless of our differences, uh, regardless of our different opinions. I want us to try to build something together, uh, even with our allies. But I also want us to make sure that Palestinians are all engaged. Um, I want to see um, um, efforts where Palestinians around the world are, are reached out to. Uh, they have a way of, kind of relating and going back to their own country if they want. For example, if the PA really wants the interest of the Palestinian people, why aren't they, for example, issuing passports for all Palestinians around the globe to make sure that everybody ha holds on to their identity? Um, there's just this lack, there's a lack of effort on part of uh, the PA and any other uh, government who claims to be uh, supporting the Palestinian people. It's really practically underground. Our rights are being taken away gradually. Um, our identity is being taken away gradually. Um, and I want PAL to be this organization that defeats all of that and brings the Palestinians back together in Palestine and around the world. Um, I'm going to leave it to you, Haytham. Salam, everyone. Ubay, thank you very much for that amazing talk. Um, it's, well, I feel like we need a moment to just process that and absorb it. Uh, thanks also, of course, to our wonderful Lamis and Amani and Akid, Rami and Tariq and everyone, everyone at PAL who's been working hard to put this together. My name is Haytham El Zabri. My family is from Arabi, Qadajanin. I have lived in the Shatat all of my life, except for two years in Ramallah, where um, I experienced our wonderful Sulta. Um, so I want to share my thoughts about where we are and why I organize with PAL. I feel, and I think we all recognize that right now our cause is in a state of emergency. 
Gaza is under a genocidal siege. Its conditions are already unfit for human life. <clears throat> Al-Quds is being squeezed and stolen, and our people in the 48th Palestine are heavily discriminated against. Our prisoners, including children, are being tortured and abused. Our people in the West Bank continue are continuously under assault from two directions. Our refugees have been languishing for decades and their conditions are just getting worse. And Israel keeps getting away with horrific crimes with full impunity. And to top this all off, we have an illegitimate self-appointed leadership speaking on our behalf, negotiating our rights away. So I feel we're at a point where, you know, I'd call this pretty much an existential crisis. And I feel it's really incumbent on all of us to resist with all we've got. Here in the US, I think we're, we're really privileged compared to most Palestinians around the world. And being in the country that enables Israel, I feel it's just, we have to join together and fight hard and defend our people and stand up for our rights. So PAL is a vehicle to assert our voice to mobilize, to liberate. So we invite you all to join us. Peace. Omar, I think you have to unmute Samar Rami. Um, I just unmuted Omar and, uh, okay, I just found Samar. While you do that, I just want to say hi to Hind, who's peeking in through Ubay's. Hi, guys. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Hi. Hi, Hind. Hi, it's, it's It's an honor to see you both. Um, and I've been also following your campaign online. Why? Well, uh, Ubay was... Um, uh, kidnapped, I'm going to say kidnapped during that time. And I, my heart was out with, to you um, both. Uh, it's just absolutely criminal to be um, separated, separate you two specifically, you know. So um, alhamdulillah, see you both together. It's beautiful. <laughs> Um, uh, I, first of all, I want to thank everybody um, at PAL. You, I just want to say, give the shout out to all of you for working so hard these past two years and being on this amazing journey with you. It's been an honor. Obey um, your uh, lecture, like your talk right now, just uh, it's, it's, it was amazing. And your words um, truly is, is the bringing all of this together, basically, um, us in the diaspora, Palestinians and diaspora, and you, uh, the Palestinians inside the Palestine, um, it just it just makes all sense and it, it meshes perfectly. And um, I just wanted to uh, um, say really quickly why I decided to join um, PAL. Um, honestly, I've been, I'm a refugee's refugee. Um, I was born outside, I lived outside all my life and, I was able to visit Palestine only when I was 28 years old. Um, despite that fact, um, I grew up with this, this um, longing for Palestine. I've never visited, never been, but this longing, which I think a lot of Palestinians in diaspora feel, and this um, yearning to do something and to be effective and to be uh, part of something bigger, a, a, a holistic unifying force that could actually push us into liberation. And um, I'm not a superstar like most of these, you know, act amazing organizers and pal. I'm just like a, an average person every day. I, I am an activist of sorts, but I'm an everyday housewife. But uh, uh, so I just, uh, for me to come in and see um, how actual real hard hitting organizing happens was truly a pleasure. And um, I feel that you know, being part of PAL will um, will unify us, will get us to be able to work towards this common goal of liberating Palestine through decolonization, achieving self-determination through actual specific plans and specific um, projects. Um, Sijil Ana Palestini is one of them, I feel. Um, 
when all of us in the diaspora come together, um, we, we will have a voice and a belonging, a sense of belonging. And um, I think that's a, a unique approach. And I think that's, um, that, that will ultimately um, push us to be cohesive with all, all Palestinians all over the world. Um, and I would just like to say, if you, if anybody out there is looking for something that is, that is really, um, uh, very, very, um, unique, I feel in my, for me personally, unique and very, um, uh, uh, targeted, um, in to achieve, you know, liberation for us, um, PAL is certainly the place to be. So please register and uh, thank you all very much. As we kind of queue up questions, Tarek and uh, Samia, hopefully you'll be managing. Um, uh, I just also wanted to say if anybody wanted to email us, uh, we also have an ongoing kind of open WhatsApp group where we can have discussions even about the work and the direction um, and the committees that are being formed. So if anybody wanted to send that out as well. And to also say that actually Summer is probably one of our strongest members who might have come into uh, PAL new uh, pretty early on, uh, but is really quite a leading force of, of PAL. Thank you, Samad, uh, Haytham, and Rami. Um, I wanted to ask if anybody uh, has any questions for the panelists or about the organization, please feel free to uh, either post it in the comments or raise your hand. Um, I'm not tech savvy, so I'll, um, I'll look, keep on the lookout to see if anybody wants to ask a question. Uh, but here I see a hand raised, so let me uh, work on that. Go ahead, Samia. You can just speak. Hello, everybody. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, and thank you <coughs> to all the organizers. I am. Uh, extremely humbled and honored to be in a space that um, exhibits such resilience and uh, such uh, leadership and understanding the need for us to collectively, uh, or I do have a question for uh, Obey. I'd like to uh, know what his immediate asks, asks would be uh, of the PAL community. How can we best uplift you? Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and to, thank you, Samia, by the way. I'm going to go ahead and take another question and then we'll have uh, answers. And then if there are additional questions, we'll also do that. Um, so I have Maha uh, Jarad. So Maha, the mic is yours. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Maha Jarad. And um, I, I guess when I came to the meeting, I thought that this was uh, an organization that was yet to be launched, but it seems like a lot of groundwork has happened in meetings and discussions. So it was hard to, you know, just follow ev everything that Amani was saying because it was, you know, all of it just put in a capsule or something. And I'm thinking, what, what is she talking about? <laughs> um, I mean, it all sounds very good, but here's a couple of my concerns. One, you know, there's always been a kind of a divide uh, between secular and faith-based organizations. Can you tell me a little bit about the discussions that, if there have been any discussions around that and how to create greater unity uh, between those sectors in our community? Because that is part of the, the issue. Everybody's kind of organizing on their own, you know, around the Palestine question. Um, also, I'd like to hear some discussion about the solidarity movement. And, you know, we live in America, so we have racism, we have sexism, we have so many movements. Um, where do we see ourselves in relation to those movements? And is this going to be an area of, of work that um, now is going to take on? Or how do you, you know, envision that? Um, there was another question, but I'll I'll leave it I'll leave it alone for now. 
Thank you, Maha. And um, we're going to start with Samia's question to uh, Abai. So I'm going to unmute you, Abai, to answer her question, and then we'll move up to Maha's uh, inquiry. Okay. Uh, so the immediate uh, things uh, that we can that we are uh, looking for from the Palestinian diaspora is uh, organizing and connecting. We have our connections, of course, but we want to do that more systematically. The second thing is uh, more coverage on what's happening, especially the uh, uh, role of the PA. This is something I know that is conflicted a little bit among Palestinian communities in diaspora, but this is something that should be put now on the forefront because we cannot have a liberation movement that doesn't uh, tidy its own house. And I think that organizing the Palestinian house is the number one step that we need to take right now. Uh, the third thing is uh, we are talking about, uh, uh, you know, with Bissan, we are launching a journal, the third issue of the progressive. and. Uh, we are talking about uh, social protection for Palestinians. And uh, what we are trying to do in this journal, the, it's in Arabic, of course, uh, but if there's a need, we will translate some of the articles, if not all of it. What we are trying to do on how we can build our own social protection, our own mutual aid uh, among Palestinians, which will contribute to our liberation. Because what has happened in the since the beginning of Oslo, and actually we can trace that even with the PLO from the 70s, is that uh, money was offered to co-opt the Palestinian resistance and Palestinian liberation movement. Uh, we can present a different paradigm as Palestinians, and this is something of mutual aid, mutual support, and this does not even, uh, of course, it have financial aspect, but uh, the focus, the core thing about it is the activities, the daily activities of people and how we can support each other. And uh, this is something I think we can start right now uh, having discussions on how we can do that, how we can plan for it and move forward. I want to uh, answer another thing about the uh, difference between faith-based organizations and uh, the people from more liberal or progressive agendas. Uh, I think uh, this will dissipate with mutual uh, struggle if we break down the barriers. The current, for example, uh, protest movement in the streets, it has all the Palestinian, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, rainbow, from the far right, and when I'm talking far right, I'm talking it as uh, uh, someone who's a leftist, I'm talking about from people that are part of a religious uh, organization, religious based, to people from uh, the far left, who are uh, completely secular or Marxist, if you want to put that. And we are finding not just common ground, we were able to come around the demands that I talked, about, talked uh, with you about. And I think all of these uh, it's mutual struggle. What the challenge that we are facing right now, it has to do with the ethnic cleansing that's being committed against us. Are we that we are now facing a question? Are we a community or aren't we a community? And we are struggling to keep uh, us Palestinians as a community. And this struggle, not just between the Palestinians in the West Bank and 48 and Gaza and abroad, even Palestinian community in the West Bank, we are being targeted to be fragmented to governorates, uh, villages, uh, clans, etc. This is why when the uh, uh, protest movement was taking a strong uh, foothold in Hebron, for example, governorate, uh, uh, I would say viciously and quite suspiciously, a clan blood was uh, reignited between two of the biggest families in Hebron governorate, in Hebron city. And uh, people shifted, the discourse shifted in Hebron from what the PA has done, uh, the need for change, to the need for uh, having uh, this cl clan clash uh, be settled. And I think that uh, uh, tidying the Palestinian 
internal house which is uh, agreeing on concrete plans and goals agreeing uh, electing and choosing a democratically elected leadership to the best of our ability where we can do elections and i think now with uh, uh, the advancements in technology, we can utilize that to have elections for Palestinians everywhere or for most of the Palestinians and have a strong, uh, accountable leadership that will lead us to first, the first step is steadfastness, the second is freedom and emancipation. Um, oh, thank you, Abay, uh, for that great answer. And uh, I know Maha, you posted those, uh, just those really incredible, uh, important questions. So we can actually have uh, uh, Amani and Lamise to answer your questions. So I'm going to um, have Amani uh, start. Thank you, Maha, for your questions, Habibti. And I'm really sorry if I confused you. That was never my intention. Um, the project um, is a vision of PAL. Uh, that we've been discussing and talking about really from our first meeting. And it's basically all the ideas that I talked about. It's what we would like to um, include in that vision. Uh, whether or not it's going to come full to life, that's going to be determined based on the team we're going to put together that's going to explore this further and make sure that it accomplishes its, its, its goal. But we're, we're beyond excited about it um, because as you heard even from Ubay and as someone like myself who's been involved in previous initiative that aim to do the same thing, it is a very important project. Uh, and we would love to uh, uh, work on it and perfect it in a way that it can work for um, the US and then like I said later on for North America and then hopefully we can have the tools to give to other activists in Europe in Africa and Palestine to do the same because I think it's crucial that we understand our numbers and our strength because there's uh, strength in numbers always. Now to answer um, the, the, the question that you related to this uh, project uh, about the difference, um, like the faith and the differences that exist. I definitely know Lemis is gonna um, chime in on this, but what I wanted to let you know is that has been the basis of all the conversations is we laid down all the uh, issues, all the difficulties that our community has been facing. And with that mind, uh, with that in mind, we've constructed all of our uh, talks and all of our um, brainstorming sessions. So um, we've definitely came with some recommendations uh, and it, it's still in the work, but I will let um, Lemis chime in on to this point, but I hope I answered your question. If I did not, feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to explain further. Thank you. Thanks, Amani, and thanks, Maha. I'm actually really excited about this question, as many of the, the folks who've been with PAL for three years know, because um, this your question really touches on the heart of I, one of our biggest struggles, um, which is not an accidental struggle. It wasn't something that we happened upon. It was something that was quite strategically manufactured against us, right? Um, and then, all, and not just against us, but against the region, um, as do all empires. This is one of the easiest um, tactics to, to deploy. And it required having some of the most difficult, uh, very long discussions and heavy bits of research. So. Absolutely, and and yes, you're right. I think in times of exigency, exigency and crisis, we don't face this uh, in Palestine. And there's also a legacy of this uh, cultural, religious pluralism. You know, who our parents and even I got to experience in Palestine as a child. So this is something that consumed a lot of our time, a lot of our intellectual labor. There was a lot of reference for us to look back at, but we also needed to create something new. And, you know, the conversations weren't, weren't easy for many of us. Um, I, I want to highlight something that Obay raised was that 
in the difficulty and in the challenges and in the discomfort and then in the disagreements, we're able to vet who's actually, yani, and not vet, but like who is able to commit what, what level of seriousness, who is that serious that's willing to place the intellectual labor to challenge ourselves. Um, and a, a little bit to your point, and forgive me for reading Ishwai Yamaha, uh, and I want to actually, before I do that, go back to something Amani raised, which is we're building the structures. We're hoping that this will be enough to sustain the tent as you and everybody else continue to build out. So it's a long time in the making. It's a lot of labor, but we are realistic and we are flexible. And we also understand that none of us are perfect and that we don't have the perfect answers. And this is subject to change. But I did want to highlight something that you raised, which it inspired the entire process, which Ayman Nijim, um, who I think is on the call and a member of PAL calls, the process of appreciative inquiry, right? Um, I call it study, research, and uh, and create. You know, the, the last, one of the last lines in the preamble of our declaration is that mere agreement to work together and based solely on aspirations for liberation, I'll skip through, have not sufficed to create optimal conditions to sustainably coordinate our efforts, have not sufficed to build a vehicle for popular and inclusive Palestinian participation in political processes, I'll skip over, and have not best harnessed the power of our people or to build mechanisms to sustain an enduring unity between our people. From there, in considering what you've raised, Maha, and everything else, we spent a long time considering and discussing and reading. And one of the documents that you don't yet have, it's not yet published, um, is this document that I passingly referred to as the principles of maximal national unity. Um, and a couple of parts that, you know, what we were trying to do is, like I said, this elaborate uh, framing, this elaborate language and thinking. So that way, when we behave, when we act, when we build the mechanisms and flesh out the structure further, we have this political basis. Um, and in that, the relevant parts I had actually clipped them out were uh, as follows, right? First and foremost, education shall take priority over doctrinal ideology uh, and education shall be encouraged and facilitated. We shall give thought and consideration in our work. Uh, now, this is for your point to solidarity. We embrace the plurality and diversity which enrich and strength strengthen our nation, and we reject that of our habits and practices which weakens our national liberation struggle and compromises our moral obligations towards each other. And we shall not allow conflicting interests, ideologies, or alignments to thwart, drown, or supplant the imperatives of return and liberation, and we shall not allow such forces to weaken our struggle. We shall pursue, uh, uh, we shall practice a conscious and constructive engagement of each other and our people for national reintegration and unity. Uh, factional and external alignments shall not take priority. Uh, we shall pursue mutual elevation, protection, and celebration, this new paradigm that we had in Palestine, you know, leading up to the 80s, right? A celebration of our religious, ideological, and cultural plurality. And this is supposed to inform PAL, but hopefully will inform how we relate to each other in the movement because it's built upon why we've seen other diaspora initiatives kind of fall apart because we're not having these difficult conversations and saying, we understand that you're maneuvering in this way. And now we could say, look, we understand you're maneuvering in this way and it's hurting us, we pivot because we have agreed to the following. We can identify, right? Political maneuvering is a thing. Um, and to your point of solidarity, that's a great point. Um, we are still considering, hopefully with you, Maha, uh, how, not how we relate, because we, I think we're all very clear on how we relate. And I think that's listed, whether it's in our mission and vision, but certainly in all of the other documents I've referenced, is that we really want to situate Palestine as the seat of global morality, which means that we are tethering ourselves to all struggles against injustice and therefore to all oppressed people. And then how do we do that structurally? What is our relationship? Where do we bring in allied organizations? Um, and, and that's where, you know, uh, this point, I think I don't need to read it just for brevity's sake. I hope that answers, but this is for development, Maha. So the folks here are welcome to input. This is not supposed to be us lecturing, but rather to say, look, this is what we've developed. There's more than what you're hearing about. Come develop it. Are we off base? What ideas do you have?
Um, thank you, Lamise. I want to. Um, I know we have questions in the comments, which we'll, we we will address as well. Uh, but I want to go to the raised hands first of uh, Burhan. Burhan, do you want to go and uh, uh, head with your question or comment? Mute myself. Uh, I wanted. Uh, uh, this is Burhan Ganaim, and I, I really appreciate all you do, guys. This is amazing initiative, and. Uh, I know you 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 really started this, but there's a lot of work to be done. And I know you realize that we all realize this. And I uh, I've been uh, actually uh, I, I cheated a little bit because I read a lot of this information before today. So I uh, uh, somebody uh, sent me the information, but I wanted to say a few things, some comments, some questions. Any initiative that we in the diaspora are gonna take is essential, but more essential than that is to have a solid base under the double occupation in Palestine. We must have a powerful start in the West Bank, in Gaza, in the 48th Palestine to really, because that is the base, that where the heart, that the, the heavy lifting needs to be done. So what was done in that arena? Uh, second, I know many of you are aware there is another initiative and I actually personally was considering uh, going to Spain to do that, which is Sabil, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Sabil Badil, but no, Masar, Masar el Badil. Arbadil. Uh, and I, there is uh, many similarities and overlap. And I, I hope we will invest the time to coordinate, maybe even unify the effort in, in order to save resources and energy and time. Um, it is very important knowing what we all know that uh, the United States is not only an enabler of the occupation and the enabler of the corruption of the PA, but they are actually partners. Look what happened after uh, the, uh, the, the killing of, of, of uh, uh, Nizar Bennett. Uh, the Secretary of State went in. They started pouring money on the corrupt PA and essentially they want it, they turn them against the people. They are, this is this colonial economic uh, arm that is, that is beating our people. Uh, I, I therefore think that the most powerful uh, group that we can put together uh, will have to start from the United States where we're gonna uh, promote this initiative. And uh, I, I know I have a lot of things. I, I hope we will continue this discussion down the road, but uh, we need to reach out to various communities in the United States and uh, various people and try to be as inclusive as possible and be prepared for the skeptics, uh, the PA loyalists and, and the tribal loyalists but we must reach out to small communities and big communities in the United States for this initiative. The initiative is amazing. Thanks everybody for, for putting the, the basis to this and the hard work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Burhan, for these uh, amazing words and for the support. Uh, I'm gonna go on to Noura next uh, for your uh, questions and comments. Thanks. Thank you, and thank you all for being here and organizing. Uh, my name is Nura Khuri, and I've been with PAL since the beginning. So I'm ex so excited to see this um, finally launching and all of the energy um, you all bring. And um, yeah, I guess um, it's really exciting to hear the potential of um, what is happening with on the ground with our brothers and sisters there. Um, so thank you so much for being here Ubay, and sharing um, what's happening on the ground because, you know, as NGOs, as political parties, there's been so much, um, I think, difficulty in 
figuring out how to express the um, like the the need for new leadership and you know I was a little bit surprised to hear you say like it's challenging for us outside um, to be um, really calling for the down with a PA or whatever we want to however we want to call it because I think our biggest challenge like I'm on the board of El Auda and I know we have been struggling with this question a lot like because so many folks are in support of um, or getting supported by the PA that um, back home, it's a little bit harder for the message to um, be heard with so many people on their payroll. And um, besides Musar Badil, which, you know, I think um, it, we've been so thankful on the ground is the one organization making that um, call from the ground. So yeah, like, um, as an alternate, we started saying, you know, um, calling for elections and um, how, yeah, are there ways that we can um, lift up the call for elections? And also, um, I saw you spoke about the registry that y'all are working on and how can we think about uh, bridging some of that work that PAL is doing um, to further the goal of the elections, um, to get people registered and, you know, make it a call, part of our call to register as, you know, like if the PA itself isn't gonna call for elections, then let it be our first big mission and coming out to, to use this force, you know, um, as, a, as a potential tool for, for that goal. Um, yeah, just what do you think about that? Um, and yeah, I guess um, I will stop there for now, but thank you. Thank you, Nora, for these uh, valuable questions. Uh, we're gonna make sure we address them as well. And then Haytham, you can go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so my question is for Ubay, being in, in the West Bank now that um, we basically have our people, it, it seems to me like, Okay, so my question is, what is the possibility that there could, this could break out into a civil war? Because it feels to me like the people who are pro-Sulta are so adamant about their positions, which are contrary to our liberation struggle. And so how can we unite with them? How can we bring them back? How do you deal with this for Dufi? Because we're having the same problem here in the US. We try to unite, Bessiani. How do you unite with someone who's who's working in the opposite direction. So um, yeah, I was just hoping you could shed some light on that, please, shukran. <clears throat> Thank you, Haytham. And uh, I see uh, Maha and uh, Bai's hands are raised. So I'm gonna have you guys speak as well. I'm gonna start with Maha. So I remembered my, uh, my, my last question. When we talk about, I just want to hear actually from, um, obey and from the um, uh, leader, leaders here in, in Pell, what are we looking to liberate? Are we talking about the West Bank and Gaza? Are we talking about one state? And how, is, there, is there a vision for that? I mean, my, a, a lot of criticism in the past has been that, you know, we, we, we put up our slogans, free Palestine, independent Palestine, but we never really had a program for what that looks like. Has there been any discussions about that in the visioning process? Thank you, Maha, and I'm gonna go uh, straight to Abai. Okay, uh, so let me start with the last one. Look, the uh, two-state solution, or the solution of having a Palestinian uh, state exist, or, right beside an Israeli state, this has dropped from everyone's agenda. And this is uh, not feasible, this will not happen. Today you have uh, 700,000 settlers in the West Bank. So the Israelis dropped it even before the Palestinians did. And the Palestinian official leadership, uh, even themselves, when you hear their uh, talks, uh, they say this is not feasible. So what's the way out? I think that we Palestinians suggested the way out back in 1936. We suggested one democratic Palestinian state from 
the river, the sea, the sea. Uh, people all are treated equally based uh, uh, and without any discrimination based on race, ethnicity, religion, etc. And uh, this solution, I think, uh, is the only way forward. This is, uh, is the way that ensures that uh, there's a democratic and free Palestine. This is my personal belief. But, uh, of course, this needs a lot more discussion. We have now different groups uh, that are discussing what kind of uh, strategic objective that can be achieved, what's, what's uh, when we say liberation or emancipation, what do we mean by it, how can we reach that. But I think this is a question for uh, uh, struggle, This we need more debate on it, we need more consensus on what uh, needs to be taken, but uh, I think that uh, uh, the Palestinian people, uh, there's actually this uh, uh, new uh, survey by Badil, which is a Palestinian organization, civil society organization, working on the right of return and the rights of refugees. Uh, they did a survey among youth between the ages of 18 and 35. And they found an overwhelming support, over 50%, for the notion of uh, a one-state solution. But what kind of one state, what kind of uh, description for that state, I think this is something for debate. The second thing, the second point that uh, I think people were asking about is uh, the issue of uh, elections. Uh, look, uh, and the issue of... Uh, uh, having, I would say, uh, how can we unite with people that are part of the system? I want to say it as bluntly as possible. We cannot unite with everyone, with not everyone, with anyone who is uh, benefiting from the corrupt position of the PA. This is something that uh, needs to be clear for everyone. Uh, when we are saying that the corrupt positions of the PA, we are not talking, of course, about small employees, even employees in the security apparatus as soldiers or uh, policemen or etc. A lot of those are, I think the vast majority of those, not just a lot, the vast majority, over 90%, are ordinary everyday people. And uh, from what we saw actually also in uh, the streets of Ramallah, even a lot of the people from the security apparatus that were asked to go out and uh, suppress the demonstrators, a lot of them refused to participate in that. So I think, so the kind of connections that we want to have, we want to have connections, of course, with Fatah, Fatah, uh, the revolution, Fatah, uh, the martyrs, Fatah, uh, uh, the people that uh, are still uh, more than 50% of the Palestinian uh, political prisoners in Israeli jails. Uh, we are having actually those kinds of connections. And I want to say that uh, the biggest repression of the PA was focused on the people who came from a Fatah background, but are critical and steadfast against the corruption of the PA and especially the small echelon that uh, controls it all, the small gang. We call it, uh, you know, those uh, 40, 50 people that uh, are really benefiting, have high positions, etc. Uh, and uh, with this kind of uh, echelon or with their stooges that are around them, we cannot have any kind of unity uh, or any kind of... We have totally different agendas. We want a free Palestine. They want to continue to rule. And they wait for it. They continue to rule is through Israeli approval. So we cannot even, even if they are present in the United States, even if they are present in uh, Europe or everywhere, uh, in the diaspora, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan, we cannot have any unique kind of unity with those people because those people have uh, reached their, uh, or not have uh, had their decision on what kind of action, what kind of future that they want, and they are just looking for their own personal benefit on the expense of the Palestinian people and its cause. Uh, 
the unity that we are talking about is a unity based on Palestinian rights. If you believe in Palestinian rights, if you are willing to act on those uh, rights, even if it's small action, of course, not everyone can be asked to uh, go and do protest. Everyone can contribute, but everyone can contribute even in a small actions. If you are willing to do that, yes, we can uh, all unite together and we should unite together and we should not look a lot about a lot on ideologies whether your ideology is marxist islamist secular uh, liberal etc if you agree that uh, we palestinian people everywhere have inalienable rights among them chiefly the rights of return and the rights of self determination as a people then we can have uh, some sort of unity among each other um, one last thing is that uh, building the connections, I would suggest that uh, we uh, continually have contacts with Lamis. Maybe we can uh, have a smaller Zoom meeting with the teams from our side and the teams from your side because we already set up, for example, a website. We are a lot of things you're talking about, we are still talking about. And uh, I'm seeing a lot of similarities, even with uh, Masar al Badil. So if we can find a way to uh, collect all of those efforts together, to coordinate more, because our tasks are uh, humongous. Uh, what, what we are facing is not just uh, the occupying state of Israel, what we are facing also is international allies and the international Zionist mechanism of propaganda against Palestinian rights. And this is not a small thing. So we need all efforts, Palestinian, Arab and uh, from uh, from the free peoples of the world also in solidarity with Palestine in order to be able to counteract uh, this kind of uh, repression. Thank you. Thank Obay. you. Obay. Um, sorry, Manny. <laughs> uh, but thank you again. I really want to emphasize on the point about, you know, still recognizing the uh, PLO, the revolutionary uh, PLO, their role, and at the same time seeking alternatives. Um, Amani, um, you're next. Thank you, Rami. And I want to thank uh, Obay for his amazing answer. Uh, everything you said, I subscribe to. Uh, for sure, we are here to advance our just cause, not so much to advance the mission of these organizations. A lot of us here, uh, uh, a lot of the leaders that are involved in this initiative with PAL wear so many different hats. And we're definitely all about advancing the just cause more so than advancing anything else. With that said, I'm gonna answer uh, Dr. Burhan's uh, question about um, not to divide our resources or not to, to build on each other's strength and all of that. And are we including other organizations? So I tell him, yes, it's it's definitely, we, we actually have a committee, an outreach committee that its job is to connect with all the existing organizations and to try to work together and build partnership. Like I said, PAL was not designed in mind to replace anyone or to take away from the work of the uh, great organizations that are doing great work for uh, Palestine. Our organization is, uh, I mean, the initiative altogether uh, is, is to enhance the work and to um, bring a different angle um, that is needed based on a lot of what you heard from Lamise and uh, from me. So with that said, um, I'm somebody who's very much involved with Masar as well. You know, I'm with al Aude, I'm with the Palestine Foundation. So um, same with uh, many of uh, the people who are involved here. So we, what, what I'm saying is all of us uh, is very mindful of this and uh, are very sensitive to the point that we want to work together and not um, divide the resources of our community. So um, we have an outreach committee that is, will be activated um, inshallah soon to uh, reach out to all the <clears throat> organizations, including Al Masaru that you mentioned and build those kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, partnerships that would help us uh, work together and advance <clears throat> the mission. So, thank you, thank you. I hope I answered uh, your question, Dr. Burhan. Thanks. And I think I'm gonna. 
take it to Lamis, uh, inshallah. Uh, Lamis, I think. Uh, yeah, sure. What I was thinking maybe, uh, Rami, uh, if you can unmute yourself and let me know, is Rosanna the last question? Maybe we could just hear Rosanna's question. Um, I'll touch upon whatever I can touch upon, and then maybe you, Tariq, and whomever else would like to close out. Is Rosanna the last one? Yes, she is. So we'll have her uh, pose her question or uh, comment, and then we'll uh, take it to Lamise and then closing. Thank you, everyone. So Rosanna, your question, please, if you can unmute her, Dami, just in case. There we go. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm glad to be a part of this. Uh, thanks to Nida Ali for um, inviting me to join today. Um, my question regard is regarding Palestinian liberation and what that means in terms of geographic or in terms of our minds. And I think that when I think about Sajil Palestini and that initiative to register people across the world into some kind of a system where we collect that data, we really need to start with liberating ourselves from a colonized mentality that is imposing threats of participation um, as activists, we all are very familiar with the pushback that we receive, the, the blocks to travel, the um, mistrust that we have. Even Obai's discussion today leads us to question, you know, which organizations can we trust, can we not trust, even within our own Palestinian liberation efforts. So my question is, how is the Palestinian Assembly for Liberation going to build that trust in the Palestinian community because I can't even do that within my own family at times. And so that is a monumental piece in this work. Well, I'm really glad that you asked <laughs> that you asked the question and, and maybe some other folks in PAL. Um, while it's fresh on my mind and I'll touch upon um, a little bit, I, and Drami, please tell me if I'm missing anything that was directed specifically towards me. Um, now, and I'll circle back, but brilliant question, Rosanna. Um, one, I do want to clarify, I know that the term data, database, uh, was used a lot, and it's just because it's a term that folks are familiar and comfortable with using, but we've been very cautious and studied in the approach, um, uh, and we've had these conversations uh, directly and as a group of what data looks like, uh, what data is saved, or what information really um, is safe to solicit, to secure, um, even, you know, I'm, I'm an attorney, I do a lot of, you know, national security and whatever work. And so, you know, I tell people all the time, there's no such thing as secure anything, right? Um, they're, they're, it's just not within the realm of possibilities, but there are ways to protect information and there are ways to solicit information in a way that doesn't cause any exposure. That's number one. The more important is what um, Ubay and what a lot of the documents that aren't necessarily public, Rosanna, um, allude to and build upon is to kind of build the critical mass that can be the space. Well, but there's absolutely just too many, um, especially vis-a-vis -vis the PA that are calling for elections, that are calling for uh, new leadership that are uh, that are wanting to register and participate. I had a conversation with a lovely young man. I, as Ubay says, we distinguish between the leadership and the cadre, and he works for, you know, the 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 mission. And he said, "Well, why why is the PA and why are my bosses so upset?" And I said, "Well, if all of us were allowed to vote, you know." who would we vote for? And he said, oh, well, that makes sense. So, you know, um, to kind of, and to break the barrier of fear. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. In terms of that internal, it's not just vis-a-vis -vis the PA. And this is what, what we say when we mean by enforcing, right? We, I think part of us, and please forgive me anybody, but my assessment, my sense, my analysis is that so many of us are kind of trained in these limitations that there are various things that are muqaddasat. You can't go to this house. You can't address this issue in this way. And these are artificial constructs because because the, dom the, the narrative and the behavior is so dominant and there are power dynamics. And I, I believe um, whether it's dealing with the issues of sectarianism or factionalism or these competing interests or perceived, you know, erroneously perceived conflicting interests is to touch the hot potato, right? And end this concept of something is too scary or too big to touch. We do it intelligently. We do it with advice. We do it with counsel and other counsel. We do it in a calculated way. So I think between these three elements, our hope is that we can develop something also command with your input. And, and we don't purport to have all the answers. We as a collective are constantly trying to come up with them. We don't see ourselves as in competition with Muslim 
Prasad Badil. I think, you know, somebody uh, raised that we, we just don't see ourselves as a Badil. We see ourselves as an organic extension of what's happening on the ground and globally. And we see ourselves as a resource, right? That us here who are taking the time and making the time and have the privilege of taking this, this, uh, this process, this studied process, this calculated process to address the things you and Matt and others have raised, we want to be a resource that can be of service to all of these formations. So there isn't this concept of competition from the chat. I saw slogans. Yeah, I mean, our struggle is certainly discursive. And so slogans become necessary in this regard, right? Discursive being our struggle is language. Language is what media is made of and what policies are made of. So we have to build slogans that people can receive, but we can't engage, especially our own people with that sort of sloganeering. It's failed us. It's failed us in these prior diaspora initiatives. And so I, I support what you're saying there. There was a question about the chart of Palestinians. That's actually one of the proposals and projects of the Unity Committee, um, which again, people haven't seen. It's not, it's not public. Um, and now that we've kind of moved this phase of the launch, and even though we're still in a very early phase of everything, that we can go back to more of the substance with more input and participation from the brilliant questions and voices and faces that have been here. I hope that answers sufficiently. Have I missed anything, Rami, that I was supposed to address? Um, no, you did not. Thank you. And uh, I think we're about to close uh, just for time's sake, but obviously it's a discussion that we could continue having. It's obviously extremely interesting. And uh, please feel free to join us, uh, you know, on Instagram or our Facebook page and register in any way. Re reach out to us individually. We'll make sure that we're able to um, facilitate that as well. Um, so we're going to end with a video. مساك بالخير يا سامع اغانينا يوم نغني للوطن تهب اشواق فينا مساك بالخير يا سامع اغانينا يوم نغني للوطن تهب اشواق فينا
you know, for all the people who raised questions that we got to or didn't get to or didn't raise questions, email us, um, drop your email here. Uh, we would love to continue building this with you. I think we've got a couple of more initiatives that we didn't discuss that are forthcoming. Um, Thank you everyone for joining us today. We really um, enjoyed all the questions. I hope we were helpful. If uh, some of the um, presentation you heard was not very clear, you have more questions like Lemise said, feel free to contact us. And until we meet next time, thank you all very much.